Lecture number seven, Expedition and Westward Expansion in North America. So in the days following the end of the American Civil War, a new, much more optimistic outlook arose in American culture. The war was a very dark time in American history as families fought each other and nearly 700,000 people were annihilated. Americans longed for a common cause, something that would bring the nation together, and the concept of westward expansion and exploration took hold like never before. Many notable photographers from the Civil War era signed on with the railroads to travel west and document the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Railroad companies wanted to excite the public, the would-be travelers, the investors, and settlers about this unlimited potential of Western frontier. They hired writers, artists, and photographers to construct persuasive narratives, uh, narratives of lush farmlands and images that portrayed the sublime grandeur of nature. This is all a reflection of the concept of manifest destiny, the right and duty of America to expand its territory and influence. And here we see a painting that is depicting this very concept. Westward, the course of empire takes its way by Emanuel Lutz. So here we see from across the continent on the Kansas Pacific Railway. So the title of the photographic album that was produced by Alexander Gardner takes its name from the previous painting, which was placed in the US Capitol in 1862. Gardner was named the chief photographer for the Union Pacific Railroad. And you might remember him from Civil War era photography and working with Matthew Brady in particular. So many of the images were survey views that were used to plan the path of the railroads, as we see here in Tejon Pass in the Sierra Nevada. This would be the modern day grapevine for those of you who know that part of the country. And here we're seeing Andrew Russell's photograph that shows the meeting point of the east and west branches of the Transcontinental Railroad. Andrew Russell also worked for Union Pacific and completed an album entitled The Great West, illustrated in a series of photographic views across the continent taken along the line of the Union Pacific Railroad. This was published in 1869. So you can see everybody enjoying themselves, toasting, shaking hands, posed very proudly for the photograph. Notice the title of this image, Advance of Civilization, End of Track near Iron Point, Nevada. So this is a stereoscopic view uh, produced by Carlton Watkins. Stereoscopic images were in wide demand as a means for travel or armchair travel for the general public. Many early travel photographers kept their businesses afloat by printing and reproducing stereoscope slides. The first ones were made in 1849 and they remained quite popular up until the turn of the century. Another view here commissioned by the railroad. And again, if you remember, the stereoscopic slides were designed to be placed inside a stereoscope viewer, which would kind of emulate human binocular vision, showing a, somewhat of a 3D style view. Other photographers, such as Timothy O'Sullivan, who was also one of uh, the photographers in Matthew Brady's employ during the Civil War, signed on with government survey teams. Surveys were done throughout the West, including the one that followed the 49th parallel or border between the U.S. and Canada. O'Sullivan worked for the U.S. engineers who were following the proposed route of the Transcontinental Railroad and a number of other survey teams that were documenting the American West as well as a team that was assigned to Panama to survey a possible canal. This image was made during a survey of the 40th parallel at Pyramid Lake in Nevada.
And here's an image in Steamboat Springs, Nevada. Notice the appearing and disappearing figure within the steam. This would have been an effect that was due to a long exposure and the ability for a person to walk in and out of the frame within that time period. So the West provided a very rich visual territory with rather unusual geographic features to those that were accustomed to the landscape tradition of European painting. So these vast open desert spaces were, were quite novel to people that were living in the East. The function of O'Sullivan's images is description, description for surveying purposes, rather than the creation of scenic landscapes. But his descriptive photographs often reflected strong compositional skills despite their purpose. So here we see a photograph taken in Savage Mine in Virginia City, Nevada. While wintering in Virginia City, Nevada, home of the Comstock Lode, O'Sullivan traveled deep underground to photograph this miner at work. The scene is lit with light that was created by igniting a magnesium wire. The danger of using this method is not apparent here, but it's almost suicidal in deep mines where volatile gases might be present. So uh, this technique would become the lighting technique for other photographers, though primarily in the form of magnesium powder on a metal plate, which then would be ignited. So although various forms of electric lighting were being experimented with, such as arc lamps in the 1870s, magnesium powder was the primary form of artificial lighting for many years. And it wasn't until 1927 that the simple flash bulb was to appear. In 1931, when Harold Edgerton produced the first electronic flash tube. The adventurous Timothy O'Sullivan takes a few moments here to document his darkroom wagon trail as it traverses the Great Carson Desert with 100-foot sand dunes. It's important to note that the transportation of photographic equipment at this time is not a simple task. The wet plate process had to be done entirely on location. The following is a report on the exploration of the Grand Canyon in 1871 and gives us an idea of what this may have been like. Quote, the camera in its strong box was a heavy load to carry up the rocks, but it was nothing to the chemical and plate holder box, which in turn was a featherweight compared with the imitation hand organ, which served for a darkroom, end quote. Some did the journey returning without any pictures at all. As one photographer notes, the silver bath got out of order and the horse bearing the camera fell off a cliff and landed on the top of the camera. Here's a very dramatic vertical composition picturing the ruins of an ancient Native American culture set back in a niche about 50 feet above the present canyon bed. Starting as an accidental daguerreotype operator in San Jose, Carlton Watkins expanded his photographic experience, becoming one of the most prolific documenters of the dramatic California landscape. At 21, Carlton Watkins left New York and headed out to California to make his fortune. After working in a San Jose photo studio, he established his own practice and soon made his first visit to the Yosemite Valley. There he made 30 mammoth plates by his own design. This would be a roughly 18 by 22 inches and about 100 stereograph views that were among the first photographs of Yosemite ever seen in the East. Partly on the strength of Watkins photographs, President Abraham Lincoln signed the 1864 bill that declared the Yosemite Valley inviolable, thus paving the way for the national park system. Here's a view of Watkins with his equipment and tripod under Yosemite Falls. So you get kind of an idea about the dramatic kind of landscape that had to be traversed with all of this equipment. 
Here's another view of the valley by Carlton Watkins. Notice here how the sky acts as a shape all by itself. So it's really um, an interesting idea when you think about the fact that view cameras showing images on a ground glass are upside down um, so that when the photographer is under the dark cloth, they are composing the image entirely upside down and have to sort of make decisions about the amount of positive and negative space in that manner. So this is a significant um, aspect of the compositional process. And here's a painting by Albert Bierstadt. So Albert Bierstadt saw Watkins' photos of Yosemite in a gallery in New York City and then later in San Francisco. And with Watkins' encouragement, Bierstadt traveled to Yosemite. He painted his own views of the dramatic landscapes and enlarged them onto canvas, adding a few flourishes such as European-styled Alps in the background that you don't see at Yosemite, as well as numerous other magnified conventions, waterfalls, animals, reflecting pools, a very Turner-esque looking sky. So Bierstadt and other painters of the American landscape, such as Thomas Moran, were schooled in European traditions of landscape. These were highly influenced by theories of the sublime in Romanticism and in poetry and painting by thinkers like Edmund Burke. This is the idea of the notion of God's grandeur in the landscape and the awe and fear that it strikes in us uh, being evident in these great grand Western landscape photographs as well as paintings. Here we see Watkins' incredible skill and eye for composition in this quite stunning photograph taken uh, further north along the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest. And you get that just absolute gorgeous, glossy looking water because of the length of the exposure. Another photographer of the American West was a man named Edward Moybridge. He had been trained by Carlton Watkins um, and between 1868 and 1873, Moybridge made over 2,000 photographs on the West Coast. Moybridge's compositions are very interesting in that he's not afraid to place the viewer on a precipice or in the middle of a lake, for instance. He's interested in achieving dramatic sky effects as well. And this is something that you really don't see in many photographs before Moybridge because he actually invented a device that minimized the overexposure of the sky, allowing, allowing clouds to appear. He called it a sky shade, and it was essentially a kind of molded putty that he would fit inside the camera between the lens and the plate to fit the contour of the land and sky horizon. And this would allow um, less exposure on the sky, giving you more cloud detail so that the sky doesn't just completely blow out to white. Here's an example of some of the specific cloud studies that Moybridge did in 1869. So I kind of think of his, of his device as an early form of the neutral density filter for a view camera. Painter Thomas Moran and photographer William Henry Jackson were invited to accompany the U.S. Geological Survey on an expedition to Yellowstone. At that time, Yellowstone was terra incognita to the white man. It was known for its hot mud lakes and geysers and the constant geothermal activity. Some people referred to it as the place where hell bubbled up. So here's a painting by Thomas Moran. And here's a photograph by William Henry Jackson. So with his cumbersome cameras and tripods and developing equipment and very fragile glass plates, some of them 20 by 24 inches, 
uh, this was the largest outdoor photographs ever attempted. Um, all of these things loaded onto pack mules. Jackson now works alongside Moran. He provided the objective record of Yellowstone's world of wonders for a public which believed the camera could not lie. This photograph has some hand-painted elements by Jackson to accentuate some of the bubbling and steaming of the geyser. If you look closely, you can almost see some little brush strokes. Jackson's photos of Yellowstone are the first that the public had ever seen of the area. In some ways, his photos were as alien to the public as the first pictures of the surface of the moon were. And here is a photograph of William Henry Jackson with one of his mammoth plate cameras. So remember, at this time, the image is only as big as the camera. So there is no enlarging of images at this time. So if you want a large photograph, you need a large camera. This is a photo showing Jackson's assistant with a pack mule and equipment, uh, the very large glass plates being placed. And here's an interesting thing to consider. Uh, there's often a spiritual nature to these very expansive views of the American West. So America is a very young country without the hundreds of years of religious history as in Europe and Asia. So there are no massive cathedrals or basilicas or mosques that you see in other parts of the world. For Americans, the stunning untouched landscapes of the West are thought of as nature's cathedral. So this particular image becomes quite popular to many as it was viewed by some as proof of God in the landscape. This is the Mount of the Holy Cross in Colorado. And of course, you see the cross shape formed in the geological features of the mountain. And here's a retouched postcard of Jackson's Holy Cross photograph. So this is one of Jackson's most popular images, one that he sold quite a bit. Um, and so many of his more popular images were reproduced, made into postcards, repainted and sold widely. And here we see Jackson standing on the precipice of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado in 1883. And here he is in his very own special train car. So, and you can see along with him, uh, his photographs and probably also some paintings. Um, so he's made quite a traveling studio, if you will. And we can't really talk about the great American West without talking about the inhabitants that were already there. So William Henry Jackson and other survey team photographers also found themselves documenting the more human aspects of the landscape, such as this Indian resettlement camp. So here we see the Omaha Indians building houses for their tribe. Jumping back a bit in time, here's an image by Alexander Gardner in which we see the Fort Laramie negotiations. Um, and this is with General Sherman among them and US delegates. You can see the US delegates facing the camera and you see the backs of the Native Americans in the camera. So the Native Americans would sometimes turn their backs to the camera and cover their heads as well. Uh, referring to the camera as the shadow catcher. And some felt that the shadow catcher would catch their, capture their spirits. So during the Treaty of 1868, the U.S. recognized the Black Hills and environs as Sioux land. But when gold was discovered in the area in 1874, General Custer and the miners who accompanied him essentially nullified the treaty by attacking the Sioux to protect their claims. 
This led to the Battle of Little Bighorn and the annihilation of Custer and his men. And the U.S. Army continued to battle the Sioux and seize the land back in 1876. The Modoc Indian War of 1872-73 um, is documented here in Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper. The Modoc people were of no Northern California, along the border of Oregon and Northern California, and they were resettled in the Klamath Indian Reservation in Oregon. Many of the Modocs returned to their ancestral homeland, homelands along the California and Oregon border, and cavalry troops came to remove them from settler-claimed land, uh, Western settlers. Um, so a war ensued with the Indians hiding in the very rugged terrain of the lava beds of south of Thule Lake. And photographer Lewis Heller was called in to record the topography, which was extremely rough and unfamiliar to the U.S. military. These images are uh, those of Modoc Indian prisoners. Edward Moybridge was working in San Francisco as a photographer for a commercial studio specializing in current events at the time. And Moybridge staged this image with a Native American who was working for the U.S. Army as a scout and was not a Modoc Indian at all. Notice the difference in his appearance to that of the Modoc prisoners on the previous page. Um, here you see like completely different style of dress and hairstyle. Um, and you can also see the, the quite rugged terrain upon which the battle was fought. So this image includes Donald McKay at center and two of the Indians who helped federal troops track and capture Captain Jack, who was the Modoc chief uh, who led the tribe in combat with the United States forces in California. The Modoc Indian War of 1873 was the only major Indian war fought in California and the only Indian war in which a general was killed. It was one of the most costly wars in our history considering the number of people involved. So Captain Jack finally surrendered at Willow Creek on June 1st, 1873, and the war ended, and he was hanged a uh, few months later. The surviving Modocs were taken to the Kapaa Agency in Oklahoma, where disease accomplished what bullets did not. And by the turn of the century, there were only a few hundred Native Americans left in the entire state of California. Here's an image, Indians eye view of Custer expedition entering the Black Hills, the Battle of Little Bighorn. So though, of course this battle, as we know, left Custer and his troops thoroughly defeated and it also enraged the American public which resulted in much harsher treatment of Native Americans during the last decades of the 19th century. And here we see some of the indigenous people of the Western territories. So Timothy O'Sullivan pictures a group of Navajo Indians near Fort Defiance, New Mexico. O'Sullivan's images are among the first taken of the Navajo peoples and lands. And he's much more interested in documenting the people in their own customs and traditions. Another figure in this era that's interesting to talk about is John K. Hillers. So uh, in the Southwest, Major John Wesley Powell conducted his surveys under the direction of the Department of the Interior. His surveys were both geological and ethnographic in nature. And here we have Powell seated on horseback and speaking with a Native American of the Paiute tribe near the Grand Canyon in Northern Arizona. And this is during one of his expeditions in the 1870s. So during his years as explorer and survey, Powell made great efforts to gain the trust of Native Americans, uh, the Native Americans with which he came into contact. He compiled vocabularies, collected details of religion and lore of Indian peoples, 
and championed the rights of Native Americans. When Congress created the Bureau of Ethnology in 1879, Powell was named its first director, a post that he held until his death. So back to talking about Hillers. John K. Hiller started as an assistant to Powell's photographer. And after losing two photographers on the trek, Hillers, who had learned to photograph en route, was hired as the main photographer. So these are some of the images that he made. And here we see Hillers at work with his negatives uh, in a camp. So you see the camera and the plates, some of the chemical bottles as well, of, of course, as the, the pack horse. Here we, we're looking at um, probably Southern Colorado or, or Utah, the Four Corners area. This view is listed as number 21 in the 1875 Powell survey series titled Mouth of the Narrows. This is credited to Hillers and it shows the Rio Virgen with a large view camera on a tripod and various plate boxes on the ground uh, across the river there. And the other thing that we see is Hillers documenting some of the strange and interesting land features of the Southwest. And in addition to that, Hillers went into Indian territory under the direction of Powell, with whom he'd worked for years. Powell used Hiller's photographs to gain congressional support for further expeditions. The images brought public recognition to both men when they appeared in the Powell survey exhibit at Philadelphia's 1876 Centennial Exhibition, a World's Fair that was attended by over 10 million visitors. So here we have the very first photographs of the Zuni in New Mexico. And here's another Zuni Pueblo image. And so in this photograph, Hillers is demonstrating his ability to compose ethnographic views with a very artistic sensibility. He's using light and darkness to dramatic effect positioning a dense shadow diagonally across the bottom view that runs parallel to the roofs of the Pueblo and sharply contrasts with the vast desert beyond the Pueblo. At the same time, he captures the subtle details of Pueblo life. You see men dressed in ceremonial clothing and in everyday clothing. There's meat hanging to dry on the outside walls, corn drying on the roofs. Uh, the Koyemshi pictured here are sacred clowns who parody village hijinks in between the performances of the Kachina dancers um, who are impersonating supernatural beings in the very male-centered Pueblo ceremonies. Of this image, Hiller said, I found six Cheyennes who had just left the warpath, all strapping big fellows. I took them among the rocks and set them up as food for my camera. He wrote this in May 1875 in a letter to his brother. At that time, Hillers was in Oklahoma photographing scenes of life in what was then called the Eastern Indian Territory. He made this portrait of Little Bear, a proud Cheyenne warrior seated holding a long pipe the day after his arrival in that area. And here with the Moki girls, to signify their unmarried status, uh, these two Moki or Hopi women wear very tightly wrapped butterfly or ram's horn hairstyles and cornmeal dust is on their face, kind of lightening their faces. Hillers documented such variations in costume and facial adornment among the people of the mesas near the Grand Canyon. He photographed these women amid a variety of Hopi weavings part of the tribe's material culture that would have also interested the survey team. Various members of the team took notes, collected artifacts, and photographed the Indians of New Mexico and Arizona territories for research files of the Smithsonian Institution. Here we have a Hopi man weaving a blanket. Notice his back to the camera. 
And Hiller spent his life as a government photographer, also doing portraits of Native American leaders when they visited Washington, D.C. in his D.C. studio. Another photographer that did studio portraits was William Henry Jackson. He had a very long career working for the Field Museum in Chicago as a publisher, a mural painter, and as a technical advisor on the film Gone with the Wind. And interestingly, I, I like to see how the backdrop was created. We have this kind of burlap covered rock looking thing and a painted backdrop for this portrait. And that's the end of today's lecture.